one sent me, about the God that man has made. And um, by Robert McMurray, Santa Claus is coming to town. In fact, he's been in town for quite a while now. He grows fatter and more elaborate and more impish and more attractive every year. Uh, millions uh, uh, flock to his shrine, driven by commercialism, money changers, and his own priests and doting parents who feels it's wrong to rob their children of the belief in Santa Claus. And the Christmas season is full of Santa Claus and his reindeer, and it's one of the most highly commercialized seasons of the entire year. And the bells uh, ring with merry jingle on the cash registers. Um, Christmas is hailed as a great religious holiday, uh, the day when we're supposed to remember the birth of Christ. Yet everywhere we look, we see holly, mistletoe, and trees decorated with tinsel and bright lights, and images of a big, rotund Santa Claus with a white beard, dressed in a white suit, along with elves and fairies. And uh, the manger scenes may be around with Christmas carols, but uh, who cares about the living Christ of God? Will anyone deny that it's Santa Claus, the myth, not Jesus Christ, the truth that gets top billing and is featured, the featured personality of the Christmas season. Would you not agree that Christmas could not survive if there were no more commercial benefits and no more Santa Claus? The Christmas spirit is created each year not to honor Christ, but to sell merchandise. And um, the thing is, this uh, Santa Claus actually uh, is, is he's an imposter. He's an imposter that is kind of like Christ. Uh, uh, Santa Claus has a white uh, uh, beard, like wool. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus Christ, his hair is white like wool. Um, uh, again, he has a beard. Isaiah 50, verse 6, Jesus Christ has a beard. Santa Claus dresses in red apparel. Uh, Isaiah 63, verse 2, Jesus Christ comes in red apparel. The hour that Santa is going to come in night, you know, the kids are all waiting, but it's a mystery. When will he show up? I remember waiting and as a little boy and my Uncle Richie saying, you know, you've got to get to sleep because if, if he knows, if you know when he's coming, he won't come. He only comes at, at an unknown time. Uh, the hour of Christ's coming is a mystery, Matthew 13, 33. Uh, Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. It's interesting, Jesus Christ comes from the north. Psalm 48, verse 2, Ezekiel 1, verse 4. Uh, Santa Claus, well nowadays we live in a 21st century and everything is plastic, but when Santa Claus started out, uh, really big in this country in the 1800s, in the 19th century and through the 20th century, his job, of course, was building toys and most of the toys were made of wood. That's carpentry. Uh, Jesus Christ was a carpenter. Matthew, uh, uh, Mark 6, verse 3. Um, Santa Claus, I I interestingly, he's omniscient. He seems to know if you've been bad or good. Well, uh, Jesus Christ is omniscient. Hebrews 4, 13 and 1 John 3, 20. Uh, uh, he's, he's omnipresent. He knows when you're waking or sleeping. He seems to be at all the malls and all the shopping places. Well, Jesus Christ is omnipresent, Ephesians 4, 6 and John 3, 13. Uh, Santa Claus seems to be omnipotent. He can deliver all the toys in the world in a single night. Uh, well, of course, we know Jesus Christ is omnipotent, uh, Revelation 19, verse 6. Santa Claus seems to live forever. He's been around as long as I can remember and stories about him actually it goes all the way back. I guess it was the 4th century when this myth kind of just began a little bit with a man that uh, the Catholic bishop in Myra, Asia Minor named Nicholas would give treats to children and then when he died um, uh, mothers told children that good Nicholas might visit them again and to bring them toys in December. And so it kind of started then. But he seems to live forever. Well, uh, Christ is ageless and eternal. Revelation 1.8 and Revelation 21.6. Uh, Santa Claus uh, lives in the heart of children. Well, Jesus Christ lives in the heart of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Santa Claus, as we said, he's a giver of gifts. Uh, according to Ephesians 4, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the giver of gifts. So what we see is, is there's a lot of um, 
counterfeiting going on here. Uh, Santa Claus, when you go to see him, the kids line up and he's sitting up there on a big, it looks like a throne. And of course, we know that Jesus Christ sits on the throne, Hebrews 1.8. Uh, children are bidden by the elves to approach the throne and to ask for what they want. That's exactly what we're told to do in, in Hebrews 4 and verse 16. We're to come boldly to the throne of grace at the time of need, like the children of God. Uh, Santa Claus, of course, tells the children to obey your parents, to be good, so you'll get gifts. Uh, Jesus Christ commands all children to obey parents. Ephesians 6, 1. Uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, Santa Claus then ultimately will judge whether you are good or bad and determine whether your gifts are going to be uh, good or some coal in a stocking. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, sits in judgment. Uh, Romans 14, verse 10. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Interestingly, the word Chris Kringle means Christ child. That's right. yeah. Very interesting. So, I mean, a great, great counterfeiter. And um, gifts are given on basis of a list. He seems to keep this list that he's checking twice. That's how Jesus Christ gives his reward in Matthew 25, verse 13. And he talks about how he has this thing listed out and there's a five talents and the two talents and the one talent and how he makes his list determining who's going to get what. Uh, uh, prayers and worship, people actually pray to St. Nick. And it's interesting, um, I, I was not able to confirm this, but the author said Nick means devil. But this I do not know, so... I can't be uh, sure of this. But uh, Santa Claus ha is the Lord over a host of elves. In the Druid religion, elves are little uh, demons or tree spirits. Of course, Jesus Christ is the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 8 to 13 and Psalm 24 verse 10. It's interesting. Go to Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2. Second last book of your Old Testament. And here the Lord is talking to His people. The time of Zechariah was written at the regathering of the Jewish people after their captivity. They had to have been taken into captivity by the Babylonians for a disobedience at the temple of God and desecrating the temple of God with idolatry. And, and that, was, that was the final straw for God. Uh, and I just bring it up to modern times. You see, the Lord, as I was trying to tell someone not too long ago, a Christian person, but a little confused, I was trying to explain the Lord, the Lord is worthy to be worshipped. We'll, we'll accept that. As a matter of fact, we're created to worship Him, Revelation uh, 4. And, um, and there is a day we're going to worship Him. And what the Lord is trying to do now with us is prepare us for worship. And He does it by giving us the Word. And the Word instructs us, just like we were speaking about a few moments ago, the how. How to worship. We know who to worship. It's the Lord. We know what we're to do. We are to worship. But how to do it, that's where it gets a little tricky. And that's why this is written. He tells us how to worship. It's not for us to say, okay, I, I know I'm supposed to worship, and I know I'm supposed to worship God, so now let me worship Him my way. Uh, he doesn't quite accept that. And so in the Old Testament, He would say to Moses, here's the tabernacle, you make it exactly after the pattern I showed you. Here's how you're going to do the sacrifices all through the book of Leviticus. You do it exactly the way I told you. And he was showing them how to do it. And they were to do it with a heart, thanking God for giving the instructions so they didn't have to think them up on their own. It's simple when you get an instruction booklet. I don't know about you if you ever put anything together, but I thank God for the instruction booklets. When I try and put things together without them, I make a mess. But when I got that instruction booklet, okay, there's eight screws here and, the, and this one goes into slot A and this one goes into B. And I start doing it as the instruction booklet says, it all comes together well. That's how God is with worship. All right. So, 
So they didn't worship God properly and, and he, he, he judged them for 70 years, put them into captivity. Uh, you know, my fear today is the Christian church is not worshiping God properly. And we're kind of in Babylonian captivity. <laughs> and so much so that now even the government's telling us how to worship. And we're so dumb, we're kind of following it. Because we're not doing it God's way. We're doing it uh, man's way, the government's way, the people's way. We send uh, uh, polls out to people. How would you like the church to be? Asking people how they would like the church to be. That's not a good way to figure out how the church ought to be. The church ought to be what God says it ought to be. You know, I mean, I've had good, sincere Christians talk to me even as recently as this week as to maybe how we should run this church and what should be the direction of this church. And they're good, sincere Christians, but they're sincerely mistaken in their understanding because as much as I love them, they don't study this book as much as I do, and I'm trying to run this church according to this book. Uh, that, you know, just I'll give you a history. When the gospel was given by Christ and it, and it left to Jerusalem and he took it first into Syria and... Uh, and had it, uh, the Syria manuscripts and the, the scriptures written there. And then it began to go westward. It, it, the first place it landed was in Greece. And as soon as it landed in Greece, they took the gospel and they turned it into a philosophy and started mingling it with philosophy and education. Then it moved from Greece to Rome. And when it got to Rome, they took the gospel and mingled it with religion and turned it into a religious thing. And made a Roman church out of it. Then it moved up into Europe. And when it got into Europe, every little different province of Germany, all the various regions, they started to turn it into a, a, a traditional thing, like the cultural tradition of our area. And then finally it came to America. And when America got it, they turned it into a business. And, and today they run it like a business. And that's why we ask the people, hey, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, a businessman wants to make a sale. I want to find out what you want so I can sell you what you want. All right? But this isn't a business. And it's not a culture. And it's not, it's not a religion. And it's not philosophy. This is God's Word. And that's the only way we're supposed to do it. So, here we are in Zechariah. And the people have been put out by God for, for, for not worshipping Him the way He said to be worshipped. But now He wants to call them back to Himself. And so He says in the book of Zechariah, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, um, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in, in his hand. And, and I said, uh, Whither goest thou? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. In other words, look, God says, I know you messed up. And I put you out. But worship of me is not done. I'm going to rebuild this thing and I'm going to bring people in here and I'm going to be a wall of fire around and you're going to worship me properly. Amen. Uh, through the ages, generation after generation, more have fallen away than have fallen on their knees and turned to God. Sad. Sad. But God's not going to give up. He's still going to be worshipped. He's God. Now look, look what he says in verse 6 to them. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. So who says ho, ho? Who says ho, ho, ho? <laughs> He's a great imitator. He's a counterfeit. God's calling you to true worship. He's calling you to false worship. It's the call. And um, all throughout the world, the image of, uh, of Santa Claus is the symbol of peace. But Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Amen. And He's the image of God. So, it just this, this uh, 
Santa Claus is, is, a, is a substitute for God. Now, here's the problem that happens. And parents play along with this thing. And, and they tell a little child, and a little child growing up looks to mother and father for truth. child doesn't know any better. And mom and dad and all the other adults in society, even so much of the weathermen talk about this is the route he's taking tonight and they have Santa watches and all the adult world plays this hoax on these little kids. And so much so that, that when one kid is growing up he's believing everything mom and dad saying and then an older kid that knows the truth comes and tells them there's no Santa Claus. And that kid is willing to stand up. But my mom and dad say, and they're willing to stand up for mom and dad for a while until finally they catch on that this thing is a lie. And they realize they've been lied to by their own parents. All right, a big deal. It's just a mythological creature. Yes, but then if the child tells them about the salvation and the truth of the history and the reality of Jesus Christ, then they wonder, how can I trust mom and dad? And what it is, is Santa Claus is a way to throw out the baby, the real Christ, with the bathwater, Santa Claus, and destroy that child's confidence in parents, parents who maybe are gospel believers. No lie is of the truth. Parents are not to lie to their children. Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. We don't celebrate Santa Claus. We celebrate Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you in the next hour how God has left us a beautiful space and a time and a season to use this time which all over the world is acknowledged as the birth of Jesus Christ and why we too can celebrate and join in with it and not fight people over this. And I show you because there are, sadly there are some crazy Christians that fight over this uh, what now is a holiday, but we understand. I'm going to show you what God did. But uh, this this uh, belief in Santa Claus uh, has an influence on the child. It's not something he, he thinks about every day. He's only concerned with this Santa Claus around uh, Christmas time when the day of judgment is approaching. That's the only time he thinks about it. And um, this uh, harmful effect that it has on the child's relationship with his parents and then ultimately having a relationship with God himself, uh, wondering, well, how can I trust that? And the biggest thing I believe as a child was thrown away. And Jesus says, except you come as a child, you cannot come. And we destroy children's faith. So um, there was this letter that uh, a young mother wrote to a newspaper. I, I can't believe they published it, but... Uh, it was a long time ago. They would never do it now. Dear Santa Claus, uh, you're probably surprised to receive this letter from an adult. You, you may be even more surprised as you read it to find out that I'm neither a maiden aunt nor a disgruntled bachelor. I'm a young mother. Uh, it isn't my intention, Santa, to hurt your feelings. You see, my family has paid tribute to you for many past Christmases. My husband and I, when we were in our childhood, paid tribute to you. Now we have children who are six, four, and two. And they seem to still care for you. But how much they care really has proved a problem in recent years. It's a threatening to happen to us again this holiday season. Uh, by the way, Santa, during a family crisis, have you ever been able to tell us, Lo, I am with you always? Were you ever with us during sorrow to comfort us with these words? but your sorrow will be turned into joy? Santa, there have been doubtful times in our life. Where were you then? We didn't hear from you a calming message like I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We've come to the conclusion that you have been even less than a friend should be. We've been shortchanged. My three children have uh, stood on a windy, cold Main Street just to get a glimpse of your jolly face. They've written you uh, letters over the years. They've gone to department stores to whisper in, you, in your ear. Uh, they've worked hard at being good in anticipation of your Christmas Eve visit. Yes, uh, they've done all this as their father and I did before them. Our, our the children seem to worship you. They speak of you constantly. They watch diligently for you to come. Can you tell us, Santa... 
What have you done to deserve this faithfulness from two generations? Can you promise any future consideration in exchange for past loyalty? Uh, Santa, there's going to be a change this Christmas. There isn't going to be any Santa Claus worship in our house. We've decided to focus our attention and adoration on another one, the one who stood by us uh, the other 364 days of this year, the one who's comforted us uh, during the sorrowful and doubtful times, and yes, in the uh, times of crisis too. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's true that your name might be mentioned around our house once in a while. Old habits are hard to break abruptly, but... uh, someone else's name, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be mentioned much more often than yours. The children will probably work just as hard at being good, but they're now doing it for another reason, a one that will last the whole year long, to bring glory to the name of their Lord, uh, the one that has given them so much more, not just showed up one night a year. Uh, you may call us fickle, Santa. We don't mind. This year and all through the year, we have a comforter, a healer, A king. We don't want a myth any longer. We've talked it over. This year we've decided to give tribute, honor, and worship to the one who really deserves it, to the true giver, our God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Farewell. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll really win friends and influence people. Look, it's one thing for us to know. You don't cast your pearls before swine. I don't want to pick a fight with them on this. I don't think so. I think the more important thing is to proclaim Jesus. You think to, to tell us to... All righty. What do you think, folks? You want me to say this on radio tonight? <laughs> you want a copy of that? Okay. We'll get you to make it. Good. Yeah, I mean the thing is, the, the, uh, it kind of happens like this. The first thing the Lord wants us to do is get our eyes on Jesus, and then later on He'll start breaking down all the straw men around us. If He wasted His time breaking down straw men in our lives, we could spend all our lives breaking straw men down because there's a lot of them out there before we get the truth. So the first thing He likes to get a hold of Him. And then he begins to show the straw man. He didn't teach me by showing evolution was wrong, that the heliocentricity was wrong. He didn't teach me about any of that stuff, but the age of the earth was wrong. He got me to him. And then afterwards, he began showing me all the errors out there. But first, you've got to apprehend that truth. And that's really important. Yeah, brother, what were you thinking? Oh, well, I agree with you, Pastor. Like, I don't think this should be the focus of all people. No. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. 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 So next next uh, hour, what we'll do is I want to study the feast of dedication and the feast of tabernacles, and we'll see by working backwards approximately when the incarnation occurred, which is kind of God's way of. Uh, uh, giving us, you don't need to know the day and the hour, but the times and the seasons, you know when there's time to celebrate. So, uh, any other questions? Let's. Yes, brother. In the morning we were talking about the names, uh, the meanings for like the seasons, for instance, like winter and fall yes. and spring. Like, yes. Is there a biblical answer to those things? Or like, uh, I, was talking, I was talking about it with my brother. Uh, fall stands for like the fall of man, or like winter is like when the whole world falls. Yeah, I think I think you're you're right. Um, uh, the Jews uh, carefully, and it would seem properly, and even from their calendar, I think you're correct. The Jews traced back, and they were so methodical, they were so such careful record keepers, traced back during the Old Testament times, using the scriptures which they believed the Hasidic ones who believed you know all the books were inspired. Traced back to the time that Adam was placed in the garden and the best they could get was it was sometime in the fall, September, October, maybe September, right around September, I think. And um, uh, and they came up with a date for it. And they based their calendar on that. That's why their their calendar is 5,700 and... 
That's in your uh, what? Seven forty? No, no. Seven sixty plus thirteen, seven seventy-three. Right now, their calendar is at five seven seven. Actually, four because they just rolled over back in September. So their calendar is five seven seven four. On o Monday, from the time Adam was placed in the garden, and the best they could tell, he was placed in the garden around September. Adam. Now that's why they have Rosh Hashanah which is their new year, which is somewhere around September. And their new year began, look, the years began when Adam was placed in the garden, when God took that piece of ground and breathed life into it, and that seemed to be around that time. Um, of course, you know God changed their new year in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Yeah. I mean, he tells them in Exodus 12, 1 and 2, and then he gives the name in Exodus 13, I think it is, or 14, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so in 12, 1 and 2, the Lord spake unto Moses Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And then in the next chapter in verse 4, it says it's the month Abib. So, so, so now all of a sudden, God changes their calendar. And instead of it beginning in September, it begins six months later in March. So September 15th was then, now it's March 15th, the year begins. And instead of what it was in September, what's that number? They call it Tishrai, I think was the, the name that the Jews call that year. And their, their Rosh Hashanah falls in Tishrai. Now all of a sudden the Rosh Hashanah falls in Abib or Nisan, which is in the spring. And this was after their deliverance. And God's showing a picture that when you're in your first birth, you're born into a fall... The fall of, you're born in the fall and you end up dying in winter. But I bring a life out of death in spring and start you new. And that's why Jesus says summer is nigh because when I get the spring harvest, I'm going to begin the summer when I come back. So yeah, the falls do have a relationship that way, brother. Yes. So that's why they have two different calendars. Yeah, they have, they have the, the, the civil calendar, Rosh Hashanah, which they cling to. <laughs> they cling to that. And they have the sacred calendar, which is the one God gave them in Exodus, and they kind of ignore that. Yes, that, brother. That was my question. Yes. Why are they still... Because they're schizophrenic. Because cause you got... But that's, that's even before, before Jesus. Yes. This is, their, this is what they study Exodus. Yes. And, and so probably the Pharisees were following the, the civil calendar, and the people with a heart for God were following the sacred calendar. It, I told you, everything is it's just... It's, you can look at the picture one of two ways. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Yes. Um, I guess just continuing from there, Pastor. Um, when the Lord died in Nisan, right? He died on the cross for us. Yes. I know when we talk about Daniel's prophecy, we attach that to the 483rd year. Yes. My question is, does it have to necessarily be at the end of the year? Because Nisan's in the beginning. Can you just say he died in the beginning? And then that's part of that year? Well, actually... Um, what I'm leaning towards is a sort of uh, Luke 13, because I was trying to figure out what this parable is about. Luke 13. Uh, verses 6 through 9. And it says there, um, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it to the ground? And he, the dresser, answering, said to him, the certain man, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if it not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. So my question is this. Um, the servant man is the father. The fig tree is Israel. And the dresser is the Lord Jesus. Yes. If he's, he's looking at this tree and he doesn't find fruit for the three years. And his I'm ministry. Assuming it's his ministry. His ministry, yes. But my question is, it says this year also. The fourth year. The fourth year. Okay, so 
Halfway into the fourth year of his ministry, that's when they cut him down and that's when yeah, he cut them down. He took, the last week, he said, this will bear fruit no longer. Did he not say that? He walked into the following week, that's it. You're not bearing fruit ever again. That's when he cut it down. Yes, yes. So my question is this, is that this year also applying to that, which means at the end of the 483rd year, because they rejected the Lord as a nation, the Lord stood up in Acts 7 and judged them, like it says in Isaiah 13, and that's when they were blinded? I'll have to look at that. That's interesting. Because I've often wondered about the space of Acts 2 to 7. There's been a lot of... That's correct, sir. And that's I'm it. Find, I know it can be yes. Right, so Sure, they do. <laughs> stop, just stop for a second. People are going to divide over everything. <laughs> There's one thing we've learned, so we understand that. But yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not surprised there's going to be divisions. There's going to. Well, you're talking the full Acts from 1 to 28. Yes. yes. But we're looking at the first few chapters from 1 to 7 and trying to figure out how long a space that was. And I've often wondered about that. But you may be on to something here, brother. Thank you, and I'll consider it. Let's pray. I was going to say, brother, yes. brother John, you're asking why do people divide over it? Because they try to figure out when the body of Christ actually started. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's and another. Yeah. That's, crazy. But you're talking Calvinists. And hyperdips. Yes, yes. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, be merciful. Thankful you save us and you let us be nuts. And we are nuts just like in the Song of Solomon 6.11. And you came down to the, the garden to see the fruits and the nuts, and that's us. And thank you, Lord, for being understanding. We are children, and we run around, and we tend to make a mess of things. But help us to be good little children, especially at this season, and to help others to look to Thee. And if they ever do get a hold of thee, then we can teach them Santa Claus is a counterfeit. Thank you for being the real uh, Christ of Christmas. Thank you for being our Savior. Uh, bless us in the next hour with songs of praise and the word of edification. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.